Let's do it. Sure. All right. Well, welcome everyone to our Zoom Speakeasy. Obviously, we'll be talking again about continuous transformation. We'll be focusing on a series of lightning talks around people, processes, and technologies. I'm very excited to have a great crew here today. Uh, we'll be talking about a variety of topics. So with that, let's kind of go through very quickly how this is going to work. So uh, each talk, we've uh, revised things just a little bit. We'll be doing a five minute lightning talk on each topic. Um, and we encourage anyone who's listening in to go ahead and type any questions or comments into the chat. Um, once all three speakers have completed, we'll then open it up for Q&A. And at that point, we'll you know, pull out some of the questions that were asked either in the chat or uh, we can, you know, if it stays a small group, we can just uh, open up everybody's mics and, and just kind of have a, a fun kind of hallway chat like we would at a conference if we were actually permitted to travel these days. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and uh, bring up our first speaker. I'd like to welcome Kelly, Kelly, excuse me, Kelly Ireland, uh, who's going to be talking about vision, leadership, and organizational health. Kelly, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the, the, the first one, why is, why is having a vision critical? And, and I can tell you, CB Technologies is a company I opened about 19 years ago. And at seat of my pants, there was no vision at that time. It was, it was something I did because I needed to deliver and support a client that I didn't feel was being supported the way I felt they could be. Um, in the last three years, I have pivoted my company from being value-added reseller over to what would be more considered a solution integrator. We more like the name domain expert integrator mainly focused on uh, internet, uh, sorry, industrial IOT and IOT and OTIT convergence, you know, the new wave. Um, why is a vision critical to that? Well, I can tell you it's because it's a journey and it is a journey from day one. It involves so many elements known and more importantly, unknown. Um, th and the vision's not going to stay static. It's, when we started, we had a pretty good idea we had started researching, we had looked into, you know, at that point it was all cloud, cloud, cloud. You were just starting to really hear a seriously focus on IoT or industrial IoT. I took it upon myself to start looking at it. I had some experience prior to that into what I would call a journey, which was when I took um, CBT and we started working on high performance computing one of our clients, it was a key thing they were doing. And I thought, okay, that's, that's a path we need to follow. And we built that out. That was a much smaller, um, and that sounds funny, but that was a much smaller uh, project and journey than this industrial IOT ever, uh, I ever could imagine. Yeah. But the thing is, is I had to have an idea of where we were going, why we were going there. And especially if you are going to have people that have to follow you. Um, it kind of steps you into the next thing of the team. When you start moving down this path, I had moments where I had my, in my own team looking at me like, what the hell are you doing? Like, why are you taking us down this path? If I hadn't had that, that vision and I couldn't put that down on paper and show them the reason why, I would not have the team um, behind me. I would not have their support. I would not be able to continue. And, and the thing is, when you look at, is there a question that leadership is critical to the success of any team? The vision in this, the journey is all dependent on your team. It, it, unless you're doing something that complete, can completely be done by yourself solo, um, then you have to consider team. I grew up in a very sports-centric family. As Mark knows my father was the first coach at UNLV. He created the program from the ground up. He had been a coach, both a high school and college co coach prior to that, but he came in. And so this was building a whole entire new team. Uh, every, every fall I gained 50 brothers because my brother, my father took those kids on as his own sons and they became part of the family. The thing, um, when I look at how I run my company, how I built out my company, I truly look back at how my father ran his team, how my mom was the team mom, how she worked with these kids, how my dad approached coaching. And it was as much 
um, about leadership as it was the success of the team. Um, it was on his shoulders to choose the best members. And one of the things that I learned and that I've put into my own company is you might be able to attract an athlete or a worker that has talent beyond anything else. But if he's not a team member, then you don't have a team because almost every single time I watched, whether it be, and we've all seen this, a sports team, one of your own teams in your company, if you have someone that's not there for the team and they are there more for themselves or what they can do, then you disrupt the entire team. You will not have success. What I've done with my own company is I, one of my big things about hiring and bringing people onto a team is I hire on character. I certainly, you know, we do enough uh, research on them. We do enough through our uh, background information. We use something called predictive index that also helps. But interviews that we do with them, we have a very good grasp that they can learn something, but we can't change their character. And if we bring in someone that's not going to work in a team environment and help us get to a common goal, then I've pretty much imploded anything that's around a, a team being successful. Um, when you look at indicators, healthy versus unhealthy, the, the one I've seen, and I've seen the, this through CBT's entire journey, is communication. Everybody strives to communicate well, or at least they should. Um, when I looked at going down a path and seeing a problem, when you go back and you pull back the covers and you start thinking through what do you, you know, what has happened? It all comes back to communication, whether it be, and it's the transformation being the journey and teaming being a very specific requirement. The, the communication is imperative for the success. Um, what, when you don't have that communication and you don't have um, a, a real understanding between the groups that are contributing, the other thing that comes in is you stop collaborating or you don't have the collaboration at the level that you need. That is one of the key factors we've seen in the entire transformation process. And we even see it now that we've taken it and we've morphed it into helping deliver solutions to our clients. Because it, again, it too is a journey. It too is based on um, the collaboration. And what we found that's most, um, probably most critical is expansive collaboration. It's across every imaginable cross section. Um, we've had times where we've actually brought in a janitor, depending on what it is we were trying to uh, have as piece of the transformation you bring in people outside that you don't think could be helpful and man, oh, by the way, they can. We're seeing this right now with the way we approach solution development, which is transformation for our clients. And we tell them, bring in the broadest spectrum of worker, management, even executive, so that all contribute to what the vision is for that solution, what the deliverable is, what they should be, what the outcome should be, and what the common goal is and have everybody in that room um, believe in it and, and say, we all agree this is the common goal. We have found in our last five exercises with clients that everybody comes in with perceptions of what that journey is gonna be and what the solution's gonna end up being. And four times out of the last five, what they came up was distinctly different than the idea that they entered the room with. They also thought they were all in agreement and they found out through this exercise of communication and collaboration and expansion in this transformation that they all came together with a much better understanding of what everybody's true direction and target was. And, and now they're coming out with, we're delivering solutions that answers the question, that gives them the outcome and that gives them that common goal that they were seeking. Thank you, Kelly. That was excellent. And I'm nodding my head as you're saying certain things. So love it. And again, we just encourage anybody watching or listening in, um, go ahead and drop any questions you might have into the chat or hold on to them. Once we finish with our series of lightning talks, we'll open it up for some Q&A.
So Kelly, thank you so much for getting us started. Really great reminders and some good insights there. Really appreciate it. Um, next up, I call forward Rob Hirschfeld. We're going to talk about fixing in flight, mitigating risk during transformation. All you, Excellent. Rob. Thanks, Amy. Yep. Uh, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RecN. And I, you know, one of the things that you know we we talk about a lot in these processes our teams and the importance of getting the teams right in the communication, Kelly, I think, you know, you really nailed how important that is. But I also think we, we have a tendency to say that's the only thing that we have to get right. But there, there is tools and technologies and processes that have to support that. And a lot of times I was just in a conversation with my team where we're making changes to tools, right? We have to get everybody aligned. They have to understand the purpose of the tools and why, why we're building it. And so what I wanted to do with this is to think about when we look at transformation, you know, the word itself seems to imply that it's a one-time event that, hey, I'm transforming my organization. And that's, that really is a misnomer. What we're really doing is we're, we're building organizations that can sustain change, that have a tolerance to change. And a lot of times that does mean, you know, transforming the people and the teams and making them more resilient, but it doesn't work if you layer that in the same same platforms and tools that you've been using because those were designed for status quo thinking. And so this list of seven items I have really drive towards improving the, the, that interaction. Um, and a lot of these are very standard DevOps and agile uh, components from that. But let's, let's take this through. It's, they're roughly ordered. The first thing that's really critical from a uh, any type of transformation is to break big operations into small operations. So this fail fast strategy, um, I can't say that enough, right? Most projects are going to fail if they have too big, a, uh, you know, too big of a thing to bite off. Um, you have to figure out how to, how to start that process. And it's important to think of those things as things that you can actually be successful at. Because if, you, if you're doing a big transformation and your first steps break, you want to know that that's going to be a problem. You want to know that your organization is going to break behind that. Um, those are really important. Um, it's important from a dev process. I, I usually think of these as dev processes, but we're talking about organizational changes and the same thing applies. Um, it really, you really want to be in that conference room that Kelly was talking about where somebody's like, I can't do that. If that, if that first meeting blows up, then you know that you need to work these things out. Um, and that's technologies that people need to be able to use. And then also, but the, the people in the process behind that. And along those lines, that's where theory of constraints is a really, really important thing to consider. Um, there's a lot of great books about this Phoenix project um, being one of the, the top for this, which was based on the goal as an earlier theory of constraints book. But the idea here is if you're doing transformation and you're transforming the things that aren't the gates in your process and your organization, then you are missing the point. You're going to make things a lot harder. You're going to spend a lot of time and money fixing the wrong thing. So figure out your process well enough to know where your bottleneck is. Focus on fixing the bottleneck because that gets everything else that you do in your organization. Um, anything else, you're really spinning your wheels because once you hit that bottleneck, that's when you're actually going to have the organizational chaos from transformation. And I, I find that when people think about transformation, they'll, they typically pick the easy things first not the bottlenecks. Um, and that, that can be really hard. Um, it also has, there's also um, bypassing bottlenecks, which can be a really, a really significant problem. Uh, source of truth, we're getting into some things that are GitOps, but one of the things that really makes transformation work is that if everybody can agree to what the truth is. Um, in a code situation, that means that you've checked it into a repository where it's, where it's stable and people can see it. In any type of transformation, you need to really understand who's driving that, who knows what's going on. Multiple sources of truth undermine a transformation really quickly because then you have old and new systems. That drives us into this immutability and idempotence challenge. These are big words. They're really scary for people. Um, the funny thing about changing an organization is that a lot of times what you want to do is you want to identify small units that can be repeated and are very stable and productive. So if you don't understand what immutability is, meaning that when you're making a change, you're making a change as a, as a unit, instead of trying to break it into a whole bunch of small pieces, sometimes you have to understand what that immutable set is, what that, when you have to jump into a new system, 
or when you're making a change and that change has a whole bunch of pieces together. Um, so you have, to, you have to understand that. This is a really core technical concept that's bleeding over into everything else we do. Idempotence means that when you repeat something, you keep getting the same result. Um, and so that ends up being a, an important thing to understand from a technology perspective, but an organizational thing also. If your process isn't reliable, then you're not, you know, you're not actually dip transforming anything. You're just changing, um, actually you're creating chaos. Um, shared state resources. Um, now we're back into sort of deep, deep technical pieces. And I'm, I'm running out of time to give deeper conversations. But the idea here is that if you have a source of truth, it has to be accessible to everybody. Um, and that ends up being a very important thing. If each person has their own copy of truth, then you're, you're in real trouble. You have to figure out how you've shared that information. Um, and then this concept of chaining automation has become really central in a lot of conversations that I've had recently, right? What you might think of this is organizational silos. In transformational work, whether it's tech, technical organization, you have to connect all those pieces together. So it doesn't help you to fix one silo of organization, even if it's the bottleneck. You have to figure out how to connect all the dots together, right? For, for us, when we're looking at a data center build out, it's not, can I do one thing well? It's, can I connect all the things I have to do? That's transformative. Fixing one problem isn't actually transforming it. You're, you're improving, you're not transforming. Um, and then I can't stress the bottom enough, test, test, and automate tests. Uh, if testing is obvious, automating tests isn't obvious. If you don't reduce the cost of running a test to almost zero, then you will not use your tests. And transforming an organization is, is going to slide backwards if you're not creating ways that you've reinforced that you're doing the right thing over and over again. And that's what testing does. Without automating the tests and making them inherent in everyday work, then you never have a way to, to stay at the level that you've attained you will constantly be slipping back down. That's true very practically in, in technical work, um, but it's really true in any type of organizational work. If you're not reinforcing that pattern in a very inexpensive way, then it's gonna just fall apart because the organization will resist it. So these seven things together, you know, are very technical. They have all have technical implementations, but they apply to the organizational change and how you think about that, that process and how it should work together. So I hope this was helpful. Thank you. Great, great uh, walk the talk, uh, Rob, really. <laughs> you know, obviously you've been there many times, so appreciate the insights, you know, for sure. Next up, uh, Rich Miller is going to talk about data-driven digital transformation. So Rich, go ahead. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Amy. I'm Rich Miller. I'm CEO of Telematica in Palo Alto. Um, I really enjoyed um both Kelly's and Rob's uh, talks. And in particular, I want to point out that almost every point that Rob made in particular um, in his list applies and is heard as applying to development of software, the maintenance of process, the establishment of organization. But only rarely do we hear those very same things being spoken about the raw resource that we use to feed many of these processes, which is the data itself. We've all heard this data is the new oil and we'll have executives that, uh, and even board level people I've heard talking about data-driven business strategies when they're developing business objectives and so forth. But I think what has been missing time and time again is a consideration of the data set as a very important ingredient to be considered in these processes. And it's time to rethink how data governance and data management can enable decision-making culture, enhance the relationship between businesses, data, and the various parts of an organization that ends up going through and into um, the digital transformation. And the reason I say this is that even in companies that are generally thought of to do a good job of digital transformation, 
they're looking at how to trans transfer things to the cloud, how to operate in the cloud, how to manage it in a hybrid situation or a multi-cloud. Many of these organizations, even with all of that attention, are still facing challenges when implementing data governance and management programs, mostly because they think of data governance and governance as one of those things that's a checklist, it's a compliance audit that you have to go through and it's more of a pain than anything else. And what I guess I'm here to say is it doesn't have to be that way. And in fact, rethinking data governance is a very important aspect because otherwise you have basically created sand traps, landmines, tar pits for yourself because you have unclear data ownership, you have missing considerations on the proportionality of cost and risk, you have legislation on data protection that you have to deal with, GDPR, CCPA, HIPAA. You have siloed departments and organizational structures that both Kelly and Rob have just spoken about. You can address those, but if you don't address that artifact that's running all the way through them, the data set on which they run, you're going to have problems. As in any situation where you manufacture or run through a process, if you don't start with good ingredients, if you have poor data quality in this case, and don't attend to that right up front, you have the makings of a problem. So in thinking through all of this, what I'd like to kind of leave you with are kind of some lessons we're learning more and more when we focus on the data side of data digital transformation. And the first order of business is establishing a, a data governance foundation. Good data governance means how you set the groundwork for collecting and using data. And this includes legal, business, intellectual property, customer sensitivity considerations, regulation. And there are lots of questions you really do need to ask at the outset before you generate data internally for the use in your processes or acquire it from the outside. What data do you already have and what do you need to use? What are the data governance practices that are already taking place in the data life cycle? Who's responsible for the governance structure? How is the data managed? Starting out with that governance frown, that governance groundwork is really es exceptionally important. Second issue is the establishment of a data architecture that is at the outset meant to evolve. Rob has mentioned it, Kelly has mentioned it. These are not processes and structures that done once, remain in place, or should remain in place. Just as we now have embraced continuous integration in the design and building of computer software, you really need to think about continuous integration and continuous deployment of the data sets on which you run. So establishing the first order data architecture, and that could be you know, the major types of data, the logical data assets, the physical data assets, the architecture you're using, whether it's a data warehouse or a, an unstructured um, form of um, cloud object storage, if that's, if that's the approach. Recognize that you're starting at a point but it's going to evolve and it's going to evolve quickly. One of the things that I continue to come back to with most of our clientele and people that we're working with in this arena is the notion of assuring data quality 
and cleaning polluted data as soon as you take responsibility for it. The, the conceit of the data lake has been, I don't have to do much with the data. I can pour it all into the data lake and somehow magically it will make it, it will be available to me when I need it, I'll be able to find it. All will be wonderful. The data lakes have turned into data swamps. If you don't establish a means of going through data processing, filtering, some initial management that addresses data quality, as soon as data is acquired and onboarded, you run some fairly serious risks. One of the last points we'll talk about is the notion of data democratization, which really means making sure that you've figured out a way of sharing data and sharing access to data across an enterprise. Silos of data that are not discoverable, that are inaccessible, are going to lead to the kinds of problems we're all trying to address with digital transformation. So I'll go back to this whole notion of data quality for just a second and end there. It's first, and in fact, it's also the last. Generally speaking, data is of high quality when it satisfies the requirements of its intended use. We gather data for a lot of intentions, with a lot of intentions in mind, and then try to make use of it for something that it wasn't initially designed to answer. This is fundamental. You have to focus on the fit for, of that data for its purpose. This means accuracy, completeness, timeliness, and the consistency of which you are basically ingesting into the systems and moving through your processes. So if anything, I'm leaving you with this one thought. Consider data not as the oil or things that is consumed and burned. It's more like a crop. It's like a renewable resource. It does age, it does go away after a time, but it is not consumed in the same way an energy creation fuel is used. It takes on a different role and therefore has to be dealt with in some very different ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rich. That was great. And, and honestly, thought, you know, Kelly, Rob, and Rich, amazing job sort of giving a snapshot of some of the most important pieces of continuous transformation. Um, I also hear a lot of people who kind of talk about, oh, yeah, transformation is super easy. It's super fast. We do it one time, we're on our way. And we all know, obviously, that's not true at all these days. Um, what I'd like to do now, you know, is we've got a, a small crew on the phone. So normally we would maybe just allow folks to sort of raise their hand. What I'm going to do right now is um, go off our, deviate from our script, uh, and I'm going to actually not only allow all the uh, attendees to talk, I'm going to promote you all to panelists um, so that you guys can share your videos and, and come, come on and we can just uh, talk as a group. So give me one second. I'm uh, moving you all over to panelists. You guys can all turn your screens on if you like, um, which I think is great, if you'd like to. Uh, and if you guys want to share your videos, you can. Uh, so I am going to stop the screen share so that again, if we want to just focus on the faces, um, and then I can, you know, turn on back whatever needs to be relevant here. But uh, Andy Mann, great to see your face, mate. Nice to see you. Hey, Andy. <laughs> up, Andy? Oh, great to see you. Great session, man. I learned stuff. That's good. <laughs> you look great, buddy. Um, but let me go ahead and invite everybody to, to unmute if you like, if there's any questions that you have, um, you want any of the speakers to elaborate on any of the points uh, that they were on or something maybe we didn't cover. 
um, you know, let's just treat this like the uh, the water cooler track. Um, you know, good friends so get together. Uh, uh, but it's really hard for me, so I won't. Um, so I, I did actually have a kind of question for Kelly. Uh, you talked about hiring for culture. I love that concept. We try and do that where I work as well. Um, but it's hard. And sometimes I find that, uh, especially as a person of my uh, being, I, it's very hard to break bias. Hiring for culture it, it can actually promote bias sometimes. Can you just talk about what you do in your business to hire for culture, as you said? Well, it's hire for character. But, but following the culture that we have. I, I would say the biggest thing that we've started using is called predictive index. And it's a behavioral survey. We have not had a bad hire in about 12 months. And it's based on a very balanced view, but it's the predictive index. It is you know personal interviews, it's their background and the references. But what the predictive index does is it gives us an idea of do they, are they a correct fit for the position? And I had somebody push back on me on a panel and say, well, you know, that's not fair because then maybe you don't hire that person. And I said, well, what we found is no, I didn't hire that person for that particular position, but guess what? I gave them a job someplace else that was a much better fit. When we used the PI to go through my whole entire company, I took it first. I loved it. I had everybody else take it. We took low performing people who we were thinking of laying off or getting rid of. We actually moved them into different positions and they thrived because we put them in the position of, you know, was their nature. We had a kid that knew he wanted to be a developer. He wanted to be a coder. Great kid, young, millennial, energetic. He was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And we're like, we know, we know he's a great hire, but somehow this isn't working. Well, it turned out he was sociable. His behavior is very social. Well, you're not going to be a coder developer if you're very social. We moved him into solution <laughs> manager and he got promoted twice in the first year. So it was just putting the right match. But I think also just looking at it, what we don't do is we don't hire because somebody said, this guy's a rock star. Before you have people go hire a rock star. Well, if the rock star doesn't fit in with the rest of your team and company dynamics, then that rock star doesn't matter because they're not going to do what you need to have done. Kelly, I, I may have missed it. How large is CBT? How many, what's the employee size? We're 50 employees. We're 162 million revenue. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. That's really helpful. That's really good insight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, um, you had a point before. Go ahead. Yeah, not, not so much a question, but maybe a comment. Maybe you could elaborate on it a little bit. Um, I, I loved your point, of, uh, and I'd never thought about it that way, and I, I, I'm disappointed in myself, frankly, because you're, you're smart, and I'm trying to be as smart as you are. Um, the the notion of avoiding um, bottlenecks and working on what's easy, um, you know that that's an that's an easy problem space to to use the term easy uh, uh, multiple times here to yeah. um, to avoid. And what have you seen? I mean, to me that that is reminiscent sort of of doing an acquisition of a company. And I'm, 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 I realize I'm changing the picture here, but I want to get an idea for how you were thinking about it. When I, when I used to absorb a, a new business and think about what I did with the organizations that were coming in, one of the things that I realized really early in my efforts to do that was, if you're going to pull off a Band-Aid, pull it off and get it over with, right? Because if you don't, it just creates more of a problem down the road. It creates scar tissue. People grow roots. They grow justifications for things. Do you see that in the, in the stream of process that you're talking about relative to you know, this, this DevOps way of thinking where... You, you have the risk of creating something that becomes of its own um, and actually uh, it grows even larger than the original problem if ignored. I, you know, it's, there, there's a couple of components to it. One of them is what I call organizational half-life, meaning that you only have so much time to make a certain amount of change in an organization before they reorg and you lose the, the, the mojo to get something done. And so if you spend a lot of time chipping away at the easy problems, then you, you, lose, you lose that opportunity to, to actually make a change. 
Um, although it's, it's both, both ways. So there's, there's two strategies with this. One of them is to choke out the, um, the, the bottleneck or the problem with the thing that's going to be really hard to change. You can, if you have the right organization, change all the things around it so that when you're ready to make the big hard change, then all the support infrastructure has been built. And then sometimes that's exactly the wrong strategy because that one organization can resist, can resist changing and all they have to do is wait out the change window. And then now you've, you're, you're, you've haven't really accomplished that much because that one, that one bottleneck was actually the thing that broke everything else from moving quickly. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. It's no, an organizational problem. It's a huge tech problem, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, like, but I can actually, I can see where it's actually a problem and it's, it's weird. It's a mirror problem, but it's a distinct problem from an organization standpoint and from a tech adopt standpoint. This, this is where the chain, where we've been using this phrase automation chaining much more. And yep. what we find in organizations, and this is actually a lot of the cloud transformation stuff. The reason why people don't like the shift and lift stuff is that shift and lift, you, you bring all of the things that you can't change, a lot of times you bring them with you. Or what you find is that you've got an anchor in your organization that you, you didn't have a good way to, to automate around. Yeah. Um, and so you know, what we're really starting to talk through is, I don't just need a way to automate uh, API better, what I actually need to do is connect all these silos together. Um, because frankly, neither a strategy that I laid out, like isolating the, the hard thing to change or doing that first works that well. What you really want to do is, is say, all right, let's you know, try and row the boat together. Um, but you can't, you, know, you, you don't get to, to do that. Um, I could go on about monoliths and microservices too, but it's all, it's all the same, the same type of problem. Rob, when you talk about chaining automation, and mm -hmm. in particular, it's what it, you made the, the exact right point when you said what you're really automating and bringing into the chain is, this, is a continuous test or a set of tests. <laughs> and you're yeah. automating the testing. You're, you're automating the generation of tests. It is those tests. And the, con the continuity part of it is you're continually working with whatever it is you're you are, is your focus there, but the tests are changing and what you're trying to do is get the, the target itself to evolve over time. It's not the kind of, I want exactly the same thing to repeat itself every time I run the test. There is a, there is a continuity of evolution and what you're doing is trying to keep yourself on path. Right. That That's, is the point that most people don't grasp when they talk about automation yes. of testing. It's like, it's not the same thing. I'm not automating a manufacturing um, line on, you know, a shop floor where the nuts and bolts uh, that are coming off of a, off of a mach machining uh, element is exactly the same every time. In point of fact, the reason <laughs> for all anyway. of this is yeah. the evolution, is the transformation. And that, getting your head around that is a tough one. Testing is one of those weird ones that people don't see the value. Like they don't understand how much speed you get from testing. Yeah. That, that, right, this, I don't know, it's, it's really hard to convince somebody that they're going to write tests and then move faster mm -hmm. um, because they feel like the tests add overhead. What, what you, you have to realize is that the tests ensure that you, you don't backslip. Yeah. And that, so much that, transformation that, so is many like, times that. <laughs> exactly well, that. It's interesting that that philosophy has been embraced by the development organization pretty conclusively. We, you know, we, we generally hear about people writing software using agile methodologies. They're, they're implementing Jenkins. They're doing all of the, you know, the kinds of automated testing, various kinds, unit test, integration test, wonderful stuff. But you're not just 
writing pieces of software, you're doing a lot more. Testing has to be applied to all of those other things. This is, you know, my story is I want you to test that data set and the changes to that data set because that's the basis on which the next Everything else. report yeah. or, anal or analysis is going to be done. Yeah. And if we don't keep track of that and apply that same kind of philosophy to it, we're losing out. We're missing right. our hit. Let me take How a quick you... one sec, one sec, Rob. Hold yeah. on one sec. Uh, do any of the other folks uh, who don't have their videos on, I know they're on <laughs> mute. Does anybody have questions? Because we, you know, like we could just geek <laughs> out, just this we, group. We so let me... Out. I just yeah. want to make sure that if any of you guys have questions, please, like, you can unmute. You don't have to share your video, though you're welcome to. Anything you guys want to ask any of the speakers from today or anybody on that that's as part of this? I will go with silence as, nope, we'll just keep eavesdropping. So if you change your mind, <laughs> unmute, and I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt again. <laughs> Sorry, Rob, go ahead. Well, no, Rich, Rich makes me think about this famous instance of the, with the ozone hole, um, where we were like 10 years late detecting the ozone hole because uh, the data, the instruments were actually throwing away data from the, from the, the measurements because somebody had said, oh, we're never going to go over, you know, this, this level. And so they just, th you know, it just was, was thrown away. Um, how do you distinguish between this data grooming, if you will, and potentially, you know, throwing, you know, ignoring real trend lines that don't fit your patterns? Yeah, it's a, well, you're, it, you have, you're at great risk of introducing bias as you're mm -hmm. just pointed That's okay. out. That's exactly what that and, is, yeah. Um, and one of the ways in which you address it, in which we are addressing it, interestingly, um, in a lot of, instances is the use of alternate data or additional data. Let me give you an example. Um, in the pharmaceutical industry, they have made use of a very narrow def definition of um, data that's being used as a result of new drugs going into the market they they were initially limiting the kind of information they were using to analyze at FDA and and NIH and others the efficacy of new new drugs um, and new medical procedures. They opened up the notion of real world data and real world evidence about five years ago and really got on the path about three years ago. What that means is they were taking data that was gathered from other sources in a uniform methodical fashion, but had not been incorporated into the analysis. The reason they didn't have a means of doing the good analysis, quite frankly, they didn't <laughs> do. but yeah, once they right. had them, they started using you had one job. laboratory. <laughs> they, they, started, they started using laboratory results that were coming off of um, uh, medical labs, insurance information from EMR, the electronic medical record, so that they could start to look at correlations of pharmaceutical, patient, and demographics that they hadn't considered. Yeah. age, location, um, lots of other things about which they weren't able to determine there was any causality or any, if not causality, at least correlation. The point being that suddenly when you can start to consolidate that information, put it all in the data set, use modern analytic tools to do the kinds of feature engineering and, and inspection of it, suddenly you see where your initial data gathering was short-sighted. And what the FDA has made use of lately in this real world evidence, real world data, is nothing short of fantastic because it's done things like very rapidly identify special kind of corner cases where 
They want people for new, um, new trials, new pharmaceutical trials, formal trials. It has identified drug interactions or interactions of genomics, dr other drugs yeah. that are being used, other situational issues that they had no way to determine. Again, it's, you know, if all you can do is base it on the first order kind of sensors that you've put in place, you're, you are going to be limited. Yeah. What we have now is possibility of taking data from a lot of different sources. And that's kind of the, the miracle of a lot of this, but it's, a, it's not easy. That's... So guys, uh, Adiz actually uh, uh, sent me a private message that just said, you know, love this format, love, appreciate the shared wisdom, said he had a job, oh. but, you know, thought that was super nice. But um, anybody else have any other questions they want to cover? Again, you know, a, a group of us could just do this all day long, pretty much. Anybody? I, I've got, uh, I've actually got a question for, um, for Kelly. Um, all right, Marco, go right ahead. Kelly, here it comes. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> you you know you, you work with um, uh, organizations that are a combination of um, the most modern and um, potentially very very legacy. Um, you know what are what are you seeing? Very at, very uh, legacy. Yes, very very <laughs> legacy. Not just one legacy. Not one. Not just one. But, but there's Some multiple legacies. Legacy. Extreme uh, legacy. What are what are you seeing? You know, from an investment standpoint, as we as we are crashing headlong into um, the potential effects, uh, you know, of an economic downturn and people's risks and concerns, what are you seeing people making choices for relative to investment? Do you see them making inv uh, investments um, that would align with the topic that we're talking about right now, continuous transformation? Do you see them making more investments just to simplify the stuff that everybody in the press knows about, like being able to work from home? Um, or do you see them just hunkering down and saying, what do we have to do to cut costs to get through this? Um, what we are seeing specifically is since um, our focus on industrial IoT, IoT, mainly connected worker, mass, where before we what we saw the transformation being was very slow, like insanely slow. And from all the customers I've talked to, they said, um, I said, is it because cloud really was a promise that wasn't delivered? Um, you know, cloud promised everything and delivered um, less than what was expected in ROI, if even an ROI. We've seen tons of clients come back out of the cloud. We've seen others that have gone in. But what we saw was what we called toe dipping. When it came to IoT, when it came to um, connected worker or uh, video analytics or any of the stuff that we were doing in our project, we saw them go, oh, we're going to just dip our toe in and ROI has to be within three months. And if you don't have an ROI in three months, we're not even going to talk to you. Um, luckily, everything that we've done over the last two and a half, three years, we have vetted out, we've created the solutions, we've gathered in the ecosystem, we've delivered it into production, and we've been able to justify the ROIs. And we can now go with Connected Worker, we can showcase and say, you know, uh, ROI in weeks, let alone months, let alone years. What we are seeing right now is um, net new clients on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis, going we know we have to do something, especially connected worker. If we can do remote expert, if we could do, and we've seen it in medical, we've seen it extensively in utilities, we've seen it in manufacturing, food processing. Um, they're starting to come to us because we've, we've done this work for a year plus, and the word is now starting to get out there and they're going, these guys can deliver. The funny thing is, is what you guys were all talking about, about the approach, we use that very focused, agile, software development type approach of bringing them in. We don't just give them a connected worker because if you took the hardware and you took software, but you really didn't integrate it and you really didn't customize it to exactly what they need, 
it's like opening a present at Christmas and you give the kid the toy and he plays with it and he goes, oh, this is awesome. And look, I can do this, that. And, I, and a week later, it's over on the shelf and it's gathering dust and it stays there because you haven't really shown them the potential. We won't engage with a client that doesn't let us at least step them through what we call a quick start that lets us gather people, spend four hours with them and say, let's do this. And Mark, I have to tell you, we're doing this on probably every other day of the week now with net new clients. That's fantastic. It's, it's yeah. good to hear too. I mean, because um, I've been doing a lot of study on this. In fact, I'm supposed to be giving a talk um, in a week or so. And um, I keep digging up more and more evidence to support my intuited belief that that there's opportunity to accelerate into a downturn, not just break all the time. And that yep. while cutting can be necessary, the wrong cutting can be as bad as uh, doing nothing uh, yep. or worse, so. Well, and when you provide a solution that you can truly showcase an ROI, and you can say, I can take them out to TechSmart Chemical and say, virtually, we can tour them to wherever it is and say, here's the use cases, here's the before, here's the after, you know, here's 90% decrease in time to complete a job or yeah. a process. When yeah. I can show them that, and then they instantly can relate that to what their issue is. And they can picture it in their mind. We don't even have to step them through it. Their mind just starts going crazy. And they're like, oh, I could use it for this. And, and they start that journey. And then we just help them form it and, and create the path for them. But we've seen it uh, exponentially. We have not slowed down. We've just catapulted um, our opportunities in that. Awesome. Amazing. Awesome. Guys, we got about we got about three minutes left. Just just as an FYI. One, actually, one question to Kelly: um, How much of the IoT is net new, and how much are they trying? Do you encounter clients, customers who are trying to take? something that has been put in place already and they're trying to, I won't say lift and shift because it's a different, yeah. it's a different story. Only one person was allowed to say that today and Rob already hit yeah. there. So no, we, we exceeded that amount. We don't talk about lift and shift. It's like FICO. We don't talk about lift and shift, man. Come on. It's a hybrid no cloud it. synergies. No, no, no. <laughs> Rich, it depends on the client. Um, what we hear more often than not, and I've heard this at conferences, um, POC goes to IoT to die, right? It's POC <laughs> hell. Um, yeah. and, and it doesn't matter the size. Um, it doesn't matter the size of the client. They will tell you they've got all these POVs or POCs out there going on and they're getting nowhere. Um, right. They haven't made big investments at all. It's just been little steps. And that's why we're seeing that a lot of the large consultants aren't getting anywhere because they're trying to bite off more than they can chew. It's start really small, prove it out and then step forward. But I, I you know, it's, it's like I said, depending on the size, there's very few and the vast majority we're seeing now had no idea. Okay. And how many of them, order. how, in how many of the cases are you dealing with technical debt that they've already incurred and are trying to figure out, very figure bad. out a bit? Very little, yeah, very, very because I would say on most of the enterprise transition to cloud that yeah. I had to do over the course of the last 10 years, mm -hmm. great measure of it. They've yeah. already bloodied themselves on their first trial to get to the cloud to some sort of digital transformation because of technical debt and thought they could just yeah. Pick things up and move them to the cloud. Amy. This is a new frontier, and Thank I'm you, calling Rich. it. A, it's a new frontier. It's a new territory. Um, it's a different journey. It, it's completely different. And I, I think the only thing we're seeing is in the larger global corporations, their struggle is they. a lot of it is business units or OT side. It's not the IT side. We don't see the CIO leading this. We see the business units leading it. And right. what's happening there is, You've got a bunch of business units that are all out doing their own thing. This one's doing it that way, that way, proprietary, blah. And corporate's going, how the hell do I control this? And so my thing is, is if you don't control it in the next few years, your support system and, and how you support industrial ILT will be nothing but pure hell. Yeah. 
I, IT has a bad rap for being controlling when it's actually experiential learning for lessons, right? And we the, the cloud rewarded people for bypassing IT. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure we took the right lessons from that. Yeah. That would be a really fun, by the way, discussion, even if it was just a tiny group, that would be really fun <laughs> is if you could actually go back and fix knowing what we know now, that will work. That's that's Cloud 2030 right there. <laughs> yeah, there we go. On that note, I know uh, you know part of me just wants to make sure Rob gets to go have dinner at a normal hour. Time so to eat. yeah, it's time to eat. Anyway, thanks you guys. This was really fun, and you know we'll be in touch when the next one happens. But Kelly, welcome. Thanks so much again Thank for joining you. us today. Absolutely. Rob, Rich, great job. Um, Andy, such a treat to see your face. Uh, and Mark Teeley, great to see you as uh, here. Thanks for joining us and sticking with us the entire way. Hope everybody has a good day and we'll talk to you soon. Be safe, Take it everyone. easy, guys. Thank you Bye -bye. very much. Good to see you, Andy. Take, Take good it care, easy. everyone.